to be super. Okay, good. And um, uh, ordinarily, Dan gives a, a land acknowledgement, but I, I don't see him on yet. Um, so our order of business would be to, to do that um, when Dan gets on. And then here's the, uh, uh, an important thing just in the last week is that our national summit, that is the UNAE USA, our national organization, had their annual meeting uh, called a summit. And it was a hybrid this time in Washington and by Zoom. And seven people from Milwaukee uh, were part of that all by Zoom. And ordinarily, in regular years before the COVID epidemic we, or pandemic, we um, would devote this session, that is our, our June forum, to report back from the National Summit. Um, we're just going to give it a few minutes this time, but, um, but a lot of people participated, uh, more online, but some in person. And we heard wonderful speakers from the United Nations, uh, from various parts of the U.S. government, from uh, various parts of the UNA and, its, UNA and its associated groups. And so um, we're just going to give it a couple minutes, but um, let me just start with Martha, if I could, if you could say a few words about your experience at the National Summit. Sure. Martha was actually in Washington just before it, actually. Yes, sure. So um, it was my first year going um, in, in person. I, I participated last year uh, where it was virtual, but as Steve mentioned, this year was a hybrid and um, this year I was um, nominated to the National Council as a representative for Great Lakes Region. And so we had a meeting prior to the Leadership Summit um, from the third through the fifth. So I did a little bit of in-person and hybrid as well. <laughs> um, and this year's theme was Us Together Forward. Um, as mentioned, was in DC and it was all about empowering and engaging the UNA USA members with skills and knowledge regarding um, US, USA and UN's relationship. Um, we had some awesome workshops that really helped us, again, understand the relationship and reinforce the importance of uh, fully funding the UN. Um, so each one of those days, um, the fifth and the sixth, uh, there were sessions in person at the, um, beautiful facility uh, in DC. Um, ah, I'm so mad at myself, I forget the name. Reagan. Ronald Reagan, Reagan Building. Re yes, Ronald Reagan Building at International Trade Center. I learned it is the second largest uh, federally funded uh, building outside the Pentagon being the first, um, but awesome space where folks came together in person and did a number of different breakout sessions attended the annual business meeting, had eats and greets. Um, some of those breakout sessions was an overview of the UN, the connection and collaboration between the community and campus chapters and such. And so they did it in person as well as online. So it's pretty cool that was like the same information was provided um, to the two different audiences. There were over 500 participants for this year's um, summit. And so um, that was awesome. A little over 100 or so in person and 300 plus um, online. So that was amazing. And the, again, that was on the 5th and the 6th. Um, so kicked off that Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, there was virtual um, congressional meetings. And the Wisconsin delegation was able to meet with three offices. We met with um, Senator... You need something? <laughs> no, not at this time. <laughs> we met... Okay. Okay, thanks. We met with um, uh, Pocan's office, Representative Pocan's office. We met with, um, I'm by my daughter, Blake. Baldwin and Fitzgerald. <laughs> and Fitzgerald. Um, unfortunately, we heard from Gwen Moore's office, but they never confirmed and Ron Johnson's staffer was not feeling well, so they canceled. Um, but we did have um, really great uh, meetings with the three representatives we met with. And I'm going to pause because I've talked a lot to see if others want to chime in from their experiences at this year's summit. Actually, Annette was going to say a few words about the congressional meeting, so maybe it's time to turn it over. Annette, uh, can you jump in? Hi, I'm Annette Robertson, and I'm here with my mother, Joan Robertson, and uh, we're pleased to be at the meeting, so thank you. Um, we attended the uh, session with Representative Fitzgerald and with Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin. 
and I don't have the facts and figures in front of me. So if somebody wants to chime in, I believe it's 80 or 88% of Americans would like to see the UN fully funded. And so uh, we were encouraged uh, to mention that. And I also spoke about our United Nations schools for international learning middle school students of which there are 2000 in Milwaukee public schools, 16 schools and how they are learning not only about the Millennium Goals, but peacekeepers and learning about the different agencies and organ, organs of the United Nations and how important it is for education, for children to see the great role modeling of the UN and all, all of its facets and especially peacekeepers. So we really must support the budget and support the peacekeeper budget. Thank you. I just wanna thank you Annette and hello Joan. I just want to mention that when Annette started talking about the Model UN um, and the students and um, here locally and the work um, that's happening at Whitefish Bay High and with the middle schoolers, and there was a, a staffer who was so excited because she also was a part of uh, Model UN in college. She her, her high school did not have the program. And so she went on about how it changed her life. She was in, I believe, Senator Baldwin's office, how it changed her life and changed her major and her trajectory of like the career path. Um, so she we we were, you know, reaching out to them, talking to them, sharing stories with them. But it was so exciting to hear back from her as she shared her story um, and understood clearly the importance of our work. Very good. Thank, thank you, Martha. Yep. All right, so I, I just got word from Dan, uh, he's having computer troubles, so we'll do the land acknowledgement uh, later. So um, so the uh, main part of our activity today is having two wonderful speakers and lots and lots of discussion and comments. Uh, at the, um, uh, we'll go till about 11.30, just before that we'll break for announcements of various things uh, coming up, of which there are many. So let me jump back to Annette to introduce our first speaker. The guy that uh, Gary does not get along with. Yeah. <laughs> We're muted, I assume. We're not. Please mute. Oh, we, we've got maximum volume. Oh, that's, uh, you're nope. not muted. Uh, that's uh, Mary Alice and, uh, no. uh, and Bill Houghton, who, who we have coming in. We hear you loud and clear, Mary Alice. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, that's OK. So please mute. So Annette, uh, could you do the introduction for our first speaker? Yes, I'd be happy to. <laughs> our family's longtime friend for three generations and my colleague devoted to educate children through adult upon the workings of the UN, may I introduce Gary Shellman. Dr. Shellman is an historian of modern Europe and a former journalist at the UWM Institute of World Affairs. For 20 years, he developed more than 600 public programs focusing on international relations, global economics, and US foreign policy, including the annual George F. Kennan Forum, <laughs> International Issues. Dr. Shellman taught at UW River Falls, UNC at Charlotte, Carroll University, Concordia University, Wisconsin, and UW Milwaukee. Dr. Shellman's experience as the program director for the Institute of World Affairs and early on, his service at the European Court of the US Army Security Agency provide a unique background to address today's topic. At UWM, his research for the prestigious Morris Bromkin Memorial Lecture has reflected the contribution of the German Socialist Democratic Party program to the sweeping success of the Milwaukee Socialists in the 1910 elections. Many people in our UNA chapter and in the peace-minded community are unsure what to think and what the US should do about the war in Ukraine. We see this forum as a timely service to activists with two expert presentations from different perspectives and lots of time for discussion. NATO and the United Nations, peace in Europe. Please join me to welcome Dr. Shellman. 
Thank you very much, Annette, and thank everybody. Uh, Steve and Jack, uh, thank you for allowing me to put together this program. Uh, and uh, to uh, everybody, and uh, it's so good to see Joan Robertson there. Good morning, Joan. And thank Great. you for all you have done for our U UNA chapter. Uh, and uh, before I start, I, I did spot Luba Kudritseva on briefly. And Luba is in British Columbia now. She, she, she is uh, a native of uh, Russia, has a doctorate from St. Petersburg uh, Institute of Technology. And she worked at, with us at the Institute of World Affairs for more than a year. Uh, and uh, it's so good to see her on the program. Uh, so <clears throat> before I begin, I guess I'd like to coincide what I'm going to be saying with the mission statement of the Governor's Commission on the UN, which I was a member of until Governor Scott Walker dumped it in January of 2011, uh, that uh, the, the primary goal of the UNA and other things is to uh, educate the public on the UN and what's going on. And I, I think this program will, will fill out that role considerably. And uh, Peace Action had an email billing it as a debate, but I don't see it as a debate in part because I think uh, Professor Targ and I have a lot in common uh, I've been an activist for peace, not, not with the great uh, enthusiasm and time that he has, but uh, I belong to Veterans for Peace now. Uh, and uh, uh, generally speaking, our UNA chapter had many programs. And at the Institute of World Affairs, we had a lot of programs that dealt with uh, uh, peace in our times, uh, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> So I would begin with a, a personal story and I, I'll try to keep from being too personal through the thing, but I, I think to set the mood of what uh, Europe was like during the Cold War. Uh, in the spring of 1977, uh, during my first year at uh, uni um, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, after receiving my doctorate from the University of Iowa, I was granted permission to uh, visit uh, a, the Central Archive in uh, Potsdam, East Germany. Uh, it was uh, during the time that I was actually doing the research for my doctoral dissertation, uh, Americans weren't allowed to do that. But after I finished my doctorate and started my first year in Charlotte, I got permission. And so I had to prepay hotel room and uh, arranged to make a trip to Potsdam. Uh, when I entered um, East Berlin to catch a train to Potsdam, uh, I had, of course, uh, to deal with the border guard. The border guard uh, inspected my briefcase and uh, I had just purchased a Der Spiegel magazine to have some reading material because I didn't know what my accommodations were gonna be like. And uh, the border guard pulled it out, waved it at me, said, uh-uh, propaganda, and he kept it. So then I had to find my way to Potsdam, and this was behind the Berlin Wall, of course, at the Friedrichstrasse railway station, boarded a train, which went uh, due east, uh, due east, and uh, made a sharp turn south and came back west in order to get to Potsdam, which was uh, on the south west corner of uh of the of the greater berlin area on the outside of the wall uh, and uh, uh on the train i had shared a compartment with a couple of soldiers in gray uniforms didn't con converse very much but uh you know i was sitting there with the alleged enemy and it uh, kind of made me you know just wondering how how it would go to be there uh, as an American in Potsdam for a week. Uh, I boarded a streetcar that could barely run uh, and uh, spotted the address of the archive and got out. And uh, it was a brick building with all kinds of guys in brown uniforms in front of it. And it didn't dawn on me until I tried speaking to German to them where the archive was that they were 
Soviet soldiers uh, ever and only understood Russian, but one stood enough, understood enough of me to get his major who spoke German, who told me the archive was in the basement underneath the Soviet barracks. Uh, so I managed to get in my first day's work there. And at the end of it, I asked the uh, archivist, uh, where is the uh, Sicilienhof Hotel? And uh, he sort of lit up and he said, oh, you go out this door, you turn right, walk through the woods, in about 10 minutes, you'll be there. And I thought, well, this sound, may it sounds kind of rustic. So I followed his instructions, emerged from the woods, and there was a large brick building there uh, with a courtyard in the back. And next to it was a flower bed with a red star in it. Now, oh my God, this is the site of the Potsdam Conference. I had no idea what the Sicilian Hulk was. So I was gonna be spending uh, the next four nights uh, under the same roof where Stalin and Truman and Churchill, and then later Clement Attlee met uh, to uh, work out the, the future of occupied Germany. That night, uh, oh, I should describe the room. It was very austere. It had a sink and a desk and nothing else. So the bathrooms were down the hall. And, but it, it faced the front of the building <clears throat> and no air conditioning, of course, and the windows were open. Uh, and uh, the phone rings and it's my wife, Sally, calling from West Berlin uh, by way of Wolfgang, her, our host for the time, and had a brief call. And uh, you know, it was, the connection was terrible. I kept getting uh, reflections. So we both decided that the phone call was bugged. So uh, did the week and then uh, in, in leaving on Friday, uh, went back the same way and uh, went down to the subway stop to go back into West Berlin. And uh, the border guard stopped me after looking at my papers and told me to wait. And uh, I had to sit and wait for about an hour while they were going through my papers. Well, Turned out that <clears throat> somewhere I had instructions to report to the police station the first night I was in Potsdam and I didn't do it. So they were checking up to find out where I was and what I did. But uh, you know, this was at a time when um, the Cold War was actually kind of easing up in 1977. So uh, everybody was cordial and it worked well, but it's just that I didn't handle the paperwork very well. well but it, uh, it occurred to me after the fact that uh, I would be spent, I spent the night, or four, four nights, where the Cold War began. And the Cold War began uh, at a round table in a, what I think had been a ballroom of the palace. Uh, this, uh, the hotel was a royal palace built for the Crown Prince of Prussia in 1912. And I don't know why it's Sicilianhof, but probably is named after some relative named Cecilia. Uh, but uh, that's where the Cold War actually began. Uh, um, because uh, the, the Yalta Conference was uh, uh, much more congenial and uh, issues that came up at Potsdam hadn't even been considered yet at Yalta. Now the Yalta Conference was held in February of 1945 and uh, uh, Premier Stalin, President Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, Prime Minister, uh, met at the uh, Crimean resort of Yalta, and uh, it was there that they decided a number of important things. The first one was that uh, once Germany was defeated and uh, forced to do an unconditional surrender, uh, they would be divided up into four occupation zones. The, the victorious allies would divide it, not quite equally, but um, uh, the, the, the map was drawn that uh, uh, the Soviet Union would occupy uh, what became the East Zone, which became East Germany, the German Democratic Republic. Uh, the British would occupy the North portion, uh, you know, including uh, the Ruhr Valley and uh, the ports of Hamburg, Bremen, and so on. The French would occupy uh, the Black Forest, essentially, Southwest Germany, uh, Baden-Württemberg, and the US would get all the good resort areas. We'd get the Rhineland and and Bavaria. So that was one thing. Went. Another thing that was sort of unquestionable was the attitude of the Soviet 
premier, Joe Stalin, and his generals uh, insistent that they would have free reign to, uh, uh, you know, once defeating the Nazis, that they would go back and uh, 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 liberate uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia and Hungary and, and, and um, you know, and punish uh, Bulgaria and uh, Romania for being pro-Nazi. Uh, and uh, uh, no word about uh, occupying uh, the Baltic states, which of course were under Nazi control by this time. They had only been uh, created as individual governments after the Treaty of Versailles. So Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia uh, were independent countries, but uh, when the Red Army came through, they were transformed into uh, Soviet socialist republics and uh, uh, Russian speaking bureaucrats began to populate the area as well. And then the entire Baltic coast from uh, what had been Memel in Lithuania uh, is, was now went to Lithuania, but the, the, the corner of East Prussia uh, on uh, uh, across to, to Danzig, Mecklenburg, uh, Pomerania, and then also Silesia uh, to the south. These areas uh, uh, were subjected to uh, Soviet occupation uh, and, or, or liberation, depending on your point of view, <clears throat> uh, that uh, you know created a, a, a presence of the, the Red Army uh, all the way uh, to uh, the uh, Oder River, um, you know, about 70 miles from Berlin. And the, the occupation zones of Berlin would be, be the same of the city of Berlin, uh, an island in the Soviet occupation zone would create it. So this lined up the sides for the Cold War. And the, and the Cold War uh, kind of, you know, as I say, it started uh, at Potsdam with uh, uh, Joe Stalin objecting to uh, the capitalist system being the uh, economic order of uh, of the of the occupation zones. He he would prefer to centralize the economy, uh, probably with Soviet control, but uh, that was rebuffed, and each zone developed its own economy, uh, and then. Uh, they would lead towards unification of the three Western zones, uh, which of course uh, was a, a, a red flag between uh, uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the, the other three victorious powers. I'll include France as a victorious power, uh, which would just to appease President de Gaulle later on. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, uh, the uh, economic issue uh, which way the various economies would go would uh, be the, the main thing that set up uh, friction between the West. And uh, in, in 1946, uh, the Chargé d'Affaires at uh, the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, a guy named George F. Kennan, a Milwaukeean, uh, who was long considered uh, America's top diplomat, uh, sent a long telegram back to the State Department uh, commenting on how uh, aggressive uh, the, the Soviets were in their occupation zones and uh, that uh, uh, somehow a policy had to be developed that would uh, uh, keep them from getting too far in advance. I should point out that Poland uh, suffered a lot from uh, Soviet problems be beginning in 1939 when uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact divided Poland up when after Germany invaded and took uh, victories over uh, from the, on the east side, the Soviets got a big chunk of uh, Poland uh, and uh, declared war on Finland uh, to, uh, to try to get uh, the Karelia Peninsula and some other things in the long winter war in 1939. So uh, the, the, the bad side of that was, it was later proven that the Soviets uh, uh, had what is known as the Katyn Forest Massacre uh, in which uh, they had rounded up Polish potential leaders. 
intellectuals, professors, political scientists, historians, uh, military officers, clergymen in some cases, uh, and uh, executed them, buried them in Katyn Forest. Well, uh, to make matters worse, when the Red Army came through, and uh, I think you're all aware that there was an uprising in Warsaw uh, against the Nazis. And oh my gosh, we're down to five minutes left. Holy, I'm not even through the Cold War. Uh, wow. Uh, I hope you give me another five minutes. At any rate, um, the Poland, uh, the uh, Soviets actually rounded up potential resistors in Poland, kept them in concentration camps uh, for some years. So there's a lot of tension there. Uh, moving ahead to 1948, because of the economic issues and the, the three West zones having a currency reform, uh, among other things, uh, Stalin decided to impose a blockade on Berlin, uh, the famous Berlin blockade. Uh, and uh, then the uh, uh, airlift kind of relieved it for a year. Uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, a, a government had survived it uh, without Soviet occupation. And uh, uh, a, uh, although the Communist Party in Prague was uh, the biggest party, uh, Clement Gottwald was the leader, but uh, there's a coup and uh, uh, there's a communist takeover of Czechoslovakia. Wow, how can I do this in five minutes? Um, so uh, that moves us to 1949. In 1949, uh, uh, the, um, what leads to the formation of NATO, there's a conference in Brussels in 48, uh, there's the Truman Doctrine in which uh, 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 the, the U.S. and uh, Britain will uh, help resist a communist takeover in Greece. And so the, the tensions between East and West are pretty high. Uh, and in 1949, uh, the Soviets uh, test their first atomic bomb. And um, uh, the People's Republic of China is established when uh, Mao and Joe's forces uh, chase uh, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist army out of out of their east zone and, and over to uh, Taiwan. Taiwan. It became Taiwan, and uh, the uh, uh, NATO is formed then with ten European members and Canada and the United States in October of 1949. Uh, eight months later, the uh, North Korean forces, and I, I can't take the time to go into why there's a North Korea and a South Korea, but they, in June of, 40, of 1950, they invade South Korea, and uh, there's a United States contingent of military there, and a, a sort of a South Korean army, and equipped with uh, a lot of T-34 tanks, uh, the North Korean army makes a run and pushes all of the South Korean forces, including the U.S., back to the Pusan perimeter. Okay, now we're down to two minutes, and I'm not even through the Korean War. Uh, I'm going to have to take an extra five minutes and, and make a quick run uh, from the Korean War onward. But the Korean War is important because... Um, Article 51 of the UN Charter, which was formed in 1945 by the victors of uh, the, the, the Second World War, uh, is a, uh, um, it gives uh, any independent country the right to defend itself or to, to seek aid in defending itself. And uh, uh, the United States uh, takes the issue to the Security Council of the United Nations and uh, amazingly, the Soviet representative is not there. So the Security Council passes a resolution uh, that the United Nations would come to the aid of South Korea uh, and uh, the forces there. The Korean War lasts three years, despite of what you see on television with MASH lasting seven years. Uh, and the uh, um, armistice is signed uh, in the summer of 1953 between uh, 
North Korea and China, which had come to the aid of uh, North Korea and uh, South Korea and the United Nations. And that armistice is held to this day. And NATO, that was the first call because most of the UN forces were NATO members at that time. Okay, how do we go from 1953 to the present in no time? So, uh, you know, so we have a work, I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a real skip job. NATO is fully formed, uh, you know, uh, Greece and Turkey join it in 1952. Uh, West Germany joins it in 1955. Sweden joins it in 19, excuse me, Spain joins it in 1982. Uh, and uh, that, that's about uh, the size of NATO that's there. Uh, there are uprisings in the Soviet bloc uh, in West Germany in 1953. Uh, Berlin workers go on strike and are crushed by Soviet tanks. 1954 in Poznan, Poland. Uh, in uh, 1956 in Hungary, uh, and uh, uh, there are um, no, you know, so um, the Soviet Union is flexing its muscle on uh, these satellite states, and uh, to oppose it, uh, you have NATO uh, gradually expanding, and uh, a large uh, UN army forces in uh, 19, uh, you know, by, by 1957. Marta, if you could quickly show that first poster of Walter Ulbricht and the, uh, the uh, uh, pitch to, to make all of Germany communist. It's uh, uh, taken by my office mate, uh, Joe Eagles from North Carolina in 1957. And it's, it's the bottom one there, I think. Oh, no, that's not it. Uh, at any rate, uh, it, it was a poster saying that Germany should all be communist. Well, that, that's the, oh, that, there's the map, uh, and that's fine. But uh, in the meantime, uh, the Warsaw Pact is formed, uh, which takes uh, Poland and Czechoslovakia and uh, uh, all of the eastern satellites of uh, Germany of uh, the, under Soviet control and forms them into a, a counter to NATO. Uh, it's going to be very hard to get up to the present time from from 1957. Uh, let's see, how can I do that? Um, uh, oh, okay. Oh, there it is. Uh, it's uh, the photo is of Walter Ubrecht, who is the most Stalinist of all the leaders of the satellite states, and uh, ganz Deutschland so communist, very uh, communist spirit. That means all of Germany should be communist. Okay, Martha, we can, Martha, we can take that one off now. Uh, <clears throat> this brings us to uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, and very quickly. Uh, the Berlin Wall in the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, was a major confrontation between NATO and uh, and the, uh, the the Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc. I think you all know the stories there. The wall is up uh, from uh, 1961 to 1989. It came down on uh, uh, November 8th, 1989, and. Uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis took place in 1962, uh, which uh, was a major showdown that resulted in, uh, fortunately, no, no nuclear war. Uh, the 1960s, I, I think I'll just skip over the 1960s. So if you have any questions about them, I can handle that and go to the 1970s, which was a fairly peaceful time between the Soviet bloc and uh, uh, you know, under, under Brezhnev, things, things would get contents from time to time. But finally, um, in the 1980s, uh, we get uh, Gorbachev, uh, who inherits uh, a uh, Soviet um, 
occupation war in Afghanistan, which is going to be a costly thing. Uh, and uh, uh, a hostile Ronald Reagan as president, you know, who, uh, whose most famous line was Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, or referring to the Soviet Union as an evil empire. But as it turns out that the two could get along pretty well. So um, there were serious negotiations and most significantly, um, uh, nuclear disarmament talks taking place between the two of them. And then uh, through the 1980s, uh, Gorbachev uh, incorporates two policies that are going to lead to the uh, ultimate uh, downfall of the Soviet Union. Five minutes over time, okay. I'll I mean, you're over five now. Yeah, okay. Uh, and let me uh, let me propose this. Um, we do need to resp um, respect people's time on this. Can I uh, move to the next speaker, but then give you uh, say three minutes as a respondent after he talks? Oh, okay. Let let me just bring it to the fall of the Berlin Wall very quickly. Uh, and thirty uh, seconds, please. It, yeah. Uh, November 9th, uh, nineteen eighty nine. Uh, the Berlin Wall goes down, and the Velvet Revolution takes place in uh, um, in, in the satellite countries, uh, particularly in uh, Prague with uh, Yaroslav Havel, not now Václav Havel. Uh, but uh, uh, the next point should be, what about NATO uh, without the Cold War? Because literally by 1992, the Soviet Union falls uh, December 31st, 1991. Uh, George H.W. Bush is, uh, does not want to be too harsh on Russia. So there's an effort between the development of a new Russia with uh, Boris Yeltsin as president first, and eventually leading to Gorbachev, excuse me, to uh, uh, Putin. With this takes us through the 90s. And I think probably we can pick it up uh, there, Steve, uh, uh, going on. Sorry it took so long, but if that included my introductory mark. I, I will, I'll say that that five minutes was not part of my presentation. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Gary. Uh, excellent uh, history and setting some context. So I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Harry Targ, maybe a little less known to some of you than Gary, my predecessor as president of the chapter. Um, Harry has done excellent political work for many years. Uh, has been a professor in Purdue until recently and is retired and likes to spend time in Milwaukee. So we're so pleased to have him on this forum. Let me give a little more formal introduction. He's the professor of political science emeritus and taught foreign policy, U.S. and Latin American relations, international political economy, and topics on labor studies in the Department of Political Science and the program in peace studies at Purdue University. He's currently on the board of Wisconsin Peace Action, and he's also served in other leadership positions, such as the uh, with the Committees of Correspondence for Democracy and Socialism, a national group. He has published books and articles on foreign policy and international relations and U.S. political economy, and he's a 35, 30 uh, year member of the Northwest Central Labor Council that's in Indiana. So, Harry, over to you. And we have a power. Thank point. you. Thank you so much. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Great. Uh, I, uh, uh, Gary and I suffer from the same problem, retired professors, the sort of 50 minute rule. And I prepared way too much for uh, 20 minutes. And uh, therefore I will uh, go quickly and be glad to share my slides with anybody who might be interested in, in the future. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about the onset of the Cold War. I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of NATO. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the possibilities and prospects of negotiating an end to the war in Ukraine. And finally, more directly related to the work of this organization, uh, how should one perceive uh, the United Nations uh, in the future in reference to Ukraine and other issues. Just a couple of uh, videos. Uh, uh, ironically, this says Russia wants war 
and it's an image of U.S. and NATO bases surrounding Russia and China. I think that's part of the contemporary world reality. Secondly, we're ever so close to the danger of nuclear war, and that has to be borne in mind as we think about any efforts to negotiate uh, an end to the awful war in Ukraine. Three, at the expense of the Ukrainian people, in my judgment, this is a teachable moment. And I'll tell you how I've begun to rethink my view of the way international relations works. And frankly, I'm very much impressed by the writings and uh, oftentimes videos of Vijay Prashad, an Indian scholar and activist, and I'll say a few things about him momentarily. This is some nice basic description of competing positions between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I would suggest um, clearly that there's a, what I would call the official narrative which blames the entirety of the war in Ukraine on Russia, which oftentimes regards, uh, interprets Russia's behavior as the personification of the thinking and outlook of one man, Mr. Putin, and uh, takes the view as the US government has articulated and as NATO for the most part has articulated that the US uh, and NATO must give support to Ukraine and uh, to use um, uh, Noam Chomsky's pejorative interpretation of this, that we will support and fight for the death of every last Ukrainian. I frankly am sympathetic with how he puts it. The left, uh, I think has at least two strands. One, the war is awful and it was what must end and both sides take that view. But one group uh, on, the, on the left, uh, advocates for uh, as best we can to try and negotiate a settlement of the war and that U.S. policy, that the peace movement should be engaged in trying to pressure uh, the U.S. government to take a more proactive stance on the side of de-escalation rather than escalation. Another sector of the left emphasizes more the great power chauvinism of Putin and Russia and by implication is supportive of um, US uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, particularly providing military support. Some might regard this as a controversial interpretation of that sector of the left. The first slide that I showed uh, represents the perspective of Code Pink, Peace Action and others who are demanding um, an end as best we can an end to the fighting and killing and what Russian withdrawal and also the US um, uh, ending its support for uh, Ukraine's continued fighting and urging reconsideration of the whole position of NATO in Central Europe. For starters, one, we must deplore the horrific Russian invasion and violence. And anybody who's criti critical of US foreign policy has to begin with this uh, statement, otherwise he or she is considered an apologist for Putin. Secondly, we need to address what I call the Vijay Prashad problem. And that is in part to be aware of the fact that violence has at least two and perhaps many dimensions. One, peace researchers call this direct violence, that's killing, murder domestically, uh, warfare <laughs> and to structural violence, that is the, the long-term uh, suffering of humankind brought about by structures of domestic and international systems. And the two are inextricably connected. And to preview what I want to say about Vijay Prashad, he made a wonderful presentation at COP26 last summer. There are several versions of it on YouTube uh, <clears throat> called War is a Crime. And indeed, war is a crime. Killing is a crime. Well, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a crime. But Vijay points out that the fact that almost 3 billion people live in poverty and immiseration is a crime as well. And these are inextricably connected and both have to be addressed at the same time. And that's a project of political activists and organizations like the United Nations. The making of the Cold War. 
Uh, my narrative is similar to Gary's with some differences. Um, the leaders of the great powers left the Alta conference in February with some uh, uh, agreements on the character of the post-war international system. And all three leaders, Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt came home and told their citizens about the spirit of, of Yalta. But the difference between the collaboration in Yalta and Potsdam was great. What occurred in between? President Truman was informed uh, by Henry Simpson, Stimson, the Secretary of War, that the United States was testing a powerful new weapon. And in fact, if that weapon is successful, we will have this powerful new weapon on our hip and we could do, we could demand of the Soviet Union that they behave in ways in which we like. In 1946, conflicts emerged over uh, partisans of both the US and the Soviet Union in Iran and uh, the Greek Civil War. And uh, people inside the, car, uh, the Truman administration began to make proposals that essentially uh, were constituted the development of a permanent war economy. Andrew Bosovich is one person who describes the decision-making around developing a permanent war economy. I talk about four dimensions of the Cold War that emerge. One, ideologically, the Truman Doctrine. Truman's uh, statement to Congress in the spring of 1947, warning of the danger of the spread of international communism, telling the American people that we were embarking on a long-term struggle uh, with an evil force that is the Soviet Union and international communism. A second dimension was economics, the Marshall Plan, Plan Program, which was initiated in 1947 and was designed to uh, connect uh, the economy of the United States with the economies of Western Europe, including providing, the, uh, providing economic support such that the very popular communist parties in Italy and France, for example, uh, would lose their popularity as development shifted more in a capitalist direction. And the third and fourth dimension of the Cold War involved the formation of NATO in 1947, 1949, uh, as we said, with 12 nations. And in 1950, the Truman administration embraced a recommendation called Security Council Document Number 68, a, a document which recommended no, these that people are right. Right. Or a priority. Hey, give me a second. Art, Art Heitzer, if you could mute, please. Art, please mute. Please, everybody, mute. Please. Okay, sounds better. Um, this fourth dimension, National Security Council document number 68, called for military expenditures being the number one priority of every presidential administration. And with the onset of the Cold War, NSC 68 became official policy of the United States as it still is today. If we look at membership of NATO, as, as Gary pointed out, uh, 12 countries were initiated into NATO in 1949, uh, Greece and Turkey in 1952, West Germany in 1955, which precipitated the Soviet Union to form the so-called Warsaw Pact, a defense uh, reaction to the US, Spain in 1982. And here is the memberships, uh, the expansion of NATO membership after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end to the Cold War. And after Secretary of State James uh, Baker uh, said to Mr. Gorbachev, NATO would not expand one inch um, if, uh, after the uh, Cold War ended. And so here you have the expansion more than one inch such that now there are, um, I think 39 countries in NATO. I will have to reflect on this. The NATO Charter, Charter Article 5 indicates that an armed attack and any one uh, country in NATO is considered an armed attack than all. That's, that's the sort of operational policy. And NATO has been engaged in a variety of conflicts since the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
and incidentally, many of us uh, skeptical, but at the same time, uh, positively articulated that, well, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the need of NATO no longer exists, so it should close its doors. Rather than close its doors, it uh, gave support to airstrikes against Bosnia, uh, later on the airstrikes against Serbia to defend Kosovo, participated in the war of Afghanistan, overthrew the government of, participated in the overthrow of the government of Gaddafi, and collaborated with the uh, European Union in uh, creating a web of organizations. I think uh, there's an image to show that momentarily. Uh, the expansion of NATO uh, also was paralleled by what was called in the 50s Pactomania, a variety of other uh, defense security organizations. The Rio Treaty of 1947, which was claimed to be the model for NATO, was a Western Hemisphere alliance and preceded NATO by two years, and a whole variety of additional organizations, many of them uh, created by the Eisenhower Dulles administration in the 50s. In addition, the United States has had established bilateral security arrangements with some uh, 69 countries around the world. And here is an image that I found on the internet that was quite interesting. When we talk about NATO, and from my point of view, how uh, Russia sees NATO as a threat, it's not, a, not its narrow military arm, but the fact that NATO is interconnected with a whole web of economic and political organizations, obviously the UN, but also the concert, uh, Council of Europe, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe uh, and the European Union, most importantly. So when we're talking about, by quote, NATO threat, I think we're talking about a North America, European uh, hegemonic creation of a network of political and economic and military organizations. How this relates to Ukraine, um, here are some historic data points that I think bear upon our discussion, uh, our discussions over the Ukraine war, NATO's expansion after 1991, NATO as the official uh, source of the attacks that we described, uh, U.S. covert uh, aid to, uh, to transform the government of Ukraine in 2003, and particularly 2014, uh, the role of top U.S. officials in this effort, like Victoria Doolin, and um, in the post-2014 coup, there was negotiations towards establishing some kind of regional autonomy for the eastern sectors of Ukraine, and those accords were scuttled after 2015. And we know the lead up to this war the U.S. and re, uh, Ukraine refused to uh, announce that, that Ukraine would not pursue membership in NATO. Uh, Gary referred to the sort of uh, iconic man who uh, was the key advisor to President Truman, George Kennan, who said in um, 1997 that uh, the expansion of NATO would uh, have disastrous consequences for uh, the period after such expansion would occur. And I think he was kind of uh, pro prophetic in that description. Therefore, I won't read this whole sentence, but just part of it. In my opinion, while the Russian attack on U Ukraine should be condemned, we need to recognize it as part of an ongoing war that has its roots perhaps in the era of formal empires the past centuries or the Western reaction to the Russian re revolution or the rise of fascism in World War II or the construction of NATO and the US drive for global hegemony from World War II to the present. The short-term consequences of this war are horrific for many sides, particularly the Ukrainians and those Russian soldiers who've been sent to fight. The economic consequences for Russia, while less clear, probably are disastrous. And I think the Ukraine war is having 
profoundly negative consequences in terms of US politics. The Build Back Better, the progressive program of uh, President Biden has been swept under the rug and uh, the Biden administration and the Democrats are concentrating both on the January 6th investigation and the war at the expense of these progressive, much needed programs that were uh, part of Biden's initial uh, platform and their splits on the left. Um, the long-term consequences are more complicated. If we survive nuclear war, I think the very character uh, structure of the international system might change. In my judgment, the US policy, particularly in this period, is to reestablish US global hegemony, but the competition from China is, uh, is profound, particularly at the economic level. And uh, it's clear that US policymakers regard the main challenge not as Russia and Ukraine, but the expanding influence on China uh, in the world stage. If we look at economically at the gross, to, uh, gross domestic product around the world, uh, the US and, uh, and Western Europe still uh, constitute maybe 60% of the world's GDP, uh, but China's GDP is increasing markedly. And at the same time, U.S. military expenditures continue to rise. I'm impressed by the writings of Alfred McCoy, University of Wisconsin historian, who argues that the U.S. relative uh, uh, decline economically vis-a-vis -vis China, the U.S. policymakers hope will be overcome by increasing military spending. This is a very interesting quote on the domestic side of the Ukraine war. Uh, William Hartung, an expert on US military spending, uh, has made it clear, I think he's quite right, that the war in Ukraine has been a, a bonanza for the top five military industrial corporations, including Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. U US military bases still travail the, the world. David Vine gave a webinar Monday uh, on pay, a book he wrote called Base Nation. And he said there's still about 750 US bases around the world and they cost about $80 billion. The challenge, the Belt and Road Initiative of China, not so much military, but an economic expansion of China's uh, relationship with the world, including the fact that uh, China has become the number one trading partner of, uh, of Latin American countries. Where do we go from here? My argument is the war is horrific. The first priority is to do what we can, and we being very weak peace forces, and try and pressure our side of this war, the United States, to engage in negotiations. And negotiations involve and require give and take. Uh, the establishment of agreements that are um, uh, not satisfactory uh, to any side. Of course, the withdrawal of Russian forces from Ukraine, stop the killing, withdraw the forces, a discussion of the future of the Donbass region and Crimea, and um, uh, U.S. NATO military transfers to Ukraine, begin to talk about a withdrawal of NATO from Eastern Europe and end the sanctions against Russia. Back in the 60s, I used to teach peace studies and I would have a section on the literature on bargaining and negotiation. And I was impressed with the writings of the social psychologist, Charles Osgood, who proposed what he called graduated reciprocation and tension reduction. And his argument was that a basic feature of any dispute local, domestic, or international is distrust. And therefore what is required is that one party to a conflict to initiate the process of de-escalating distrust should be the uh, make unilateral moves, inviting the other side to participate uh, with an end goal of getting all parties to negotiating table. And while the grit strategy in this case might be a real long shot to achieve, 
it's the best that uh, the best that we had to offer. And the alternative, if you take uh, uh, the grit strategy on the flip side, what you see is that U.S. policymakers are doing virtually everything wrong. Sending uh, the 40 some billion dollar military expenditures, um, the statements about Pete Putin, Putin being a war criminal, uh, the other statements that are made repeatedly are moving just in the opposite direction of what the GRIT strategy recommends. Lastly, uh, this invitation has stimulated me to begin to rethink the role of the United Nations system in this process of transforming international relations. Uh, I think the US system, uh, the UN system, back from the onset, from Yalta and Potsdam, uh, really was, was uh, two, two organizations. The one, the Security Council, was a recognition of great power politics. It was based upon the assumption of the continuation of multipolar and or bipolar uh, political and economic and military organization. The other major uh, institution in the UN was the General Assembly, which was designed to represent on a one nation, one vote basis, all the countries who were members of the UN. In my judgment, historically, these two independent, semi-independent organizations have been operating on their own. And returning back to the Vijay Prashad argument, uh, I would accept the proposition that reconceptualizing international relations has to include as a major fe uh, feature, shifting from a North Atlantic European European, Eastern European vision of uh, bipolarity or multipolarity of great powers to a North-South conception of international relations. And if you look at that history that I'm sure most of you know more than I about that North-South conception of the UN system, you'll have the proposals and debate around the new international economic order, the new world information order, and other efforts for countries of the global south to try and secure a redistribution, not only of military and political power, but of economic power. And so it seems to me, those of us who are interested in maintaining and enhancing the US system, uh, the UN system, should work to revitalize that system, to emphasize not only security and sovereignty, but economic justice and the implementation of all 30 articles of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which include economic rights as well as political rights. I refer you to a very powerful presentation I saw by Jeffrey Sachs just a few months ago on this very question of the grotesque economic inequality that exists in the world. And the bottom line, if the world is to survive, uh, both in terms of basic human needs, the climate, war avoidance, the reduction of violence, democratization, that the, this economic dimension and this part of the UN system needs to be given much more uh, support. So in sum, we need to rebuild our institutions that recognize not only multipolarity, that is US, Europe, China, Russia, but the needs of the global South. And there is very little in this discourse now over Ukraine that is addressing these broader questions. But as I suggested in an earlier slide, the unfortunately, the unfortunate character of the Ukraine war um, has provided a teachable moment to begin to rethink international relations and to shift away from the nation state model, the Cold War model, the early post-war Cold War po uh, model to a new uh, international relations. Thank you.
Steve? Steve? You're on mute, Steve. Uh, could I? Uh, uh, Gary, um, sorry, I offered you uh, two minutes as a, uh, a few minutes of response. Can you give it? No, to, I, I'm going to take more than that because I, I, we have not Gary, just contacted the relation. Steve, Steve, we have not covered the uh, the relationship between NATO and the UN very well, well and I think I can minutes, do it Gary, in ten we just, minutes. We need so to please have let time me. For discussion, we promised it. Steve, um, I would like to interrupt both of you. And my mother and I would like to give Gary five extra minutes. It won't take, but it has to be time. And you're gonna to have to be cut off after that, Gary. You've got to respect that, please. Okay. Please. Who's keeping time? Do you want me to? I will, starting now. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Harry covered the expansion of NATO just fine, but the relations with the UN has not come up yet. Here are the main operations in which NATO and the UN are involved. Peace operations, and that would include uh, the detachment of military troops to uh, end the uh, uh, Bosnian crises and war, uh, failures in Rwanda and uh, in peacekeeping, and uh, uh, Srebrenica, uh, you know, showed that more was needed. So ultimately, every operation in the Balkans that the that uh, NATO undertook was with the blessing, of, with the request of the UN. Then there's uh, counterterrorism, women, peace and security, protecting children in armed conflict, small arms and light weapons, uh, disaster release, the evolution of UN cooperation in the field and bringing peace to the former Yugoslavia. Uh, UN uh, uh, NATO troops have been called in to help the African Union troops in West Africa and in uh, uh, Sudan and other areas. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to collect my mind here. Uh, um, at any rate, these are all the functions in which NATO and the UN work and the, um, um, Worst case scenario was uh, where uh, after 9-11, the neocons sort of used Article 5 of the NATO treaty to um, make an end run around, you know, to, to, to bog us down in Afghanistan, frankly, and to uh, uh, later shift action to Syria. Uh, cooperation between the UN and NATO, I had two occasions that I witnessed. One was at the uh, World Affairs Conference at the UN in uh, 2001. Uh, we had Richard Holbrook who had organized the uh, Dayton Accords that ended the conflicts in the Balkans, except for I still, we still have troops in Kosovo. Uh, and uh, Kofi Annan, who I think is, was the, so far the greatest Secretary General of the UN. But there, the UN and NATO were together in one room. Uh, secondly, uh, at the 2014 UNA conference in Washington, uh, the best session that we had, a breakout session, was a Marine major who uh, had served in Sierra Leone during the uh, conflict in West Africa. Uh, and uh, he told how they had uh, taken care of the Ebola pandemic so it did not spread and brought peace to the civil war going on in Liberia. So uh, these are where the UN is really uh, uh, thankful to have NATO doing its heavy lifting operations. Uh, I felt pretty much the same as George Kennan and others uh, when NATO first enlarged and uh, uh, because I thought it would ruffle feathers in Russia. But uh, uh, now that uh, uh, Mr. Putin has done what he's done uh, inv invading Ukraine. I feel very strongly that it's good to have uh, the NATO units, uh, the NATO countries so unified. Uh, President Biden has done a terrific job of bringing people together. And I think that uh, looks like I have about one minute left, right? Uh, it, uh, that uh, had these countries who had all had a bad experience with either Imperial Russia or, or the Soviet Union, 
uh, it turns out that they had a greater wisdom than George Kennan and I had of, of thinking that NATO should be disbanded or pulled out at that time. So for the future, I think I agree with Harry very much. We need a, a massive conference. The UN's in the best position to run it. Uh, maybe a two-pronged one, one dealing with nuclear disarmament, the other one dealing with ending the war in Ukraine, uh, pulling things together and trying to work out uh, uh, peace in, in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, probably allowing U Ukraine to stay independent, possibly join the European Union and be a neutral uh, free trade zone uh, along with maybe even Belarus uh, between Russia and the West. It's a, 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 it's a horrible situation. Uh, I think the Bi uh, NATO and Biden are done but the best they can. I, I wish they wouldn't do as much saber, rat saber rattling in, in the, the, the uh, talk. And also regarding China, China is not our enemy. It's a five minutes. So my five minutes is up. Time. Time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Sorry to be rude, but uh, we do want to have some time for questions and discussion. So um, who would like to start? I see Jim has a hand up. Uh, yes, um, I came to this talk today to try to understand if NATO was a force for the good and for the um, uh, and for, uh, uh, for uh, 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 um, international law, promoting international law. And so my question to both of you is this. Uh, if NATO is a force for the good and promoting international law, why didn't NATO kick out the United States after the United States invaded Iraq? I mean, I'm making a comparison here. If we had a police force and a, poli a policeman on the force murdered somebody, we wouldn't keep that policeman on the force. Why was the U.S. allowed to stay in NATO after this gross of violation of international law? Would you like me to take that one? Sure. Both, both you and Harry. Okay. Well, the neocons were in charge. You know, the Rumsfeld, uh, the, the worst thing was... Uh, when Ambassador Bramer uh, transformed uh, uh, the, re the rebuilding of I Iraq into uh, an occupation of Iraq. That was deadly and was stupid. And uh, uh, NATO's only involvement in Iraq at that time was to provide some training for the uh, newly formed re Iraqi army. So, uh, it's, uh, it, it really isn't a part of uh, what NATO had done during this time. Uh, Harry, over to you. Yeah, uh, one, um, my revisiting of the onset of the Cold War is based upon a narrative that I share with people from Wisconsin, the Wisconsin School, Appleman Williams, uh, the Cocos, Alperovitz, that argues that after World War II, the US uh, began to pursue an agenda to achieve global hegemony. And that pursuit of global hegemony required an ideology as reflected in the Truman Doctrine, a uh, construction of international, a network of international organiza uh, economic organizations um, like the Marshall Plan, which led eventually to the EU. And then of course the Bretton Woods system. And in terms of the enforcers, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization being the preeminent one and the effort to create other PACs, CETO, Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, uh, CENTO, and the bilateral PACs. So from my point of view, NATO has not been, uh, never has been a progressive force. And in fact, is an institutional manifestation of the effort to uh, create or recreate uh, Western global hegemony. And if you have the Vijay Prashad argument to this, that NATO uh, is an institutional representation of that long period of colonialism where European powers divided up Africa and Asia. Uh, I, so, you know, my answer to Jim's point is that I would not see NATO as a positive force at all. And it just seems clear to me that the expansion of NATO in the post-Soviet period had to have been perceived from
from Moscow's point of view as a growing threat. And, um, and so it exacerbated the tensions and this does not in any way justify the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but it's part of the backdrop that's terribly important. So it seems to me if we wanna create peace in Europe and the world, it, we have to fundamentally rethink security organizations like NATO and maybe shift a security organizational um, function from regional organizations like NATO to the UN system and those successes that uh, Gary has referred to. All right, I see the issue has been joined. Uh, part of the uh, origin for this uh, planning for this forum was the sign that said no to NATO at uh, a peace rally. And so, so we're getting into that. So uh, Jerry, we're so nice you've got a hand up. Thank you both for your presentations. Harry, this is a question for you. Um, you've laid out a very articulate and uh, very understandable set of circumstances that you would advocate for in terms of dealing with Ukraine. Um, I come from a mental health perspective, 50 years in the mental health field dealing with systems. Uh, two questions. One is, how realistic is it that you think the kinds of things that you propose could actually be affected? And number two, if NATO is dismantled, as many in the peace movement are advocating for, without those conditions that you so well articulated are not in place, what would you predict is, would happen in Europe? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I, you know, as this crisis unfolded and I began to think of, of Osgood and the GRIT strategy, um, I became convinced that it's the only realistic path that the U.S. should take. And I began, became convinced that our very limited role in shaping U.S. policy and our being the peace movement is to make demands on our government. That it was unrealistic to assume that we could be demanding that Putin withdraw his troops and that our role is to try and shape US policy uh, towards, um, uh, towards Ukraine. Having said that, I'm not terribly optimistic that a grit strategy would work. Uh, Osgood's presupposition was that a critical element of a conflict was mistrust. And I think there's mistrust here, um, but there doesn't seem to be um, any interest on the Western side in rethinking the role of NATO in the international system. So uh, I'm not terribly optimistic, but from my point of view, it's the only logical path to take. And every day when we get up in the morning and listen to the news and hear of a new US position vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, Russia, NATO, it's a move in the opposite direction. It's escalation, it's name calling, it's the redistribution uh, or the, the transfer of more military hardware for Ukrainians to do the fighting. The last point from a mental health point of view uh, and from the point of view of the I, uh, Eisenhower's idea of a military industrial complex is it seems to me that this is a critical juncture in which what Eisenhower warned about is coming true much, much more so than he envisioned. I recently retired from Purdue University and Purdue has secured two recent military contracts with Raytheon and Rolls-Royce and one with Saab. And all of them are about national security the Purdue administrators celebrate the U.S. role in serving the interests of uh, U.S. national security and freedom in the world. Some of the administrators point out that Purdue researchers will help uh, defend the United States against the Chinese threat. So what we have, it seems to me, is a point in time 
when the penetration of militarism in U.S. society is exacerbated dramatically. And let's face it, the Democrats have been as much involved in this as the Republicans. And finally, and this is a throwaway that, you know, it's a whole conversation for another day, the reification of violence, which is reflected in the Ukraine war, is reflected in U.S. transferring arms, in my judgment, is also reflected in the horrific violence that we see on a daily basis within the United States. So, you know, I think all these things are interconnected. And we have to stand up and say no to these military institutions. So, very good. I see a question in the uh, chat. Let me, it's sort of a follow up. So, let me state it and then give Gary a chance to respond to these things uh, just talked about recently. Barbara Markoff asks uh, Please explain how the expansion of NATO was or is a threat to Russia, or conversely, why it is not. Um, Gary, care to weigh in on that or the previous question? Uh, well, I'll be happy to. Um, it's a threat to Russia, essentially, in the minds of Vladimir Putin. It's not a realistic, pragmatic threat to Russia. Uh, it, it's, uh, and the fact that uh, uh, Poland and uh, Slovakia and, and these other countries uh, are pitching in to help Ukraine is they, they just they fear an eventual thing and, and they're fine. And, and the unification of NATO just keeps it out. So it's not really a threat. Regarding uh, the industrial military complex and, and moving against it, I agree with the, the whole thing that I, I, you have to be realistic that there's so many things in place that it's extremely difficult to, to move backward. My feeling would be to start by closing down Guantanamo Bay. We don't need a naval base in Cuba anymore. We don't need a prison in Cuba anymore. And to take a, a look around the world, all those bases that you pointed out in your graphic, Terry, uh, you know, just show an overextension and an overextension of, of, of price. So uh, you have to start small if you're going to revise it. But uh, NATO is there representing 30 and maybe 32 countries after Sweden and Finland, both of whom had been neutral since uh, 1809. Uh, joining in, there, there, there's, if there's a threat, it's, it's coming from the other side. It's not coming from this side. And uh, uh, admittedly, the, the arms is, you know, it's, it, it's, there's, no, there's no easy answer to the, the fact that the killing is going on and that by helping the Ukrainians, by rearming them, it's only going to prolong the crisis. It's going to, it's going to take a long time to get, end it. Or you want to take a chance on how NATO is or isn't dangerous to Russia with a perceived yeah. um, You know, three brief comments. One, uh, threats, perception of threats need not necessarily be realistic, okay? Uh, secondly, in one of my blog essays, I referred to what um, I call historical memory. And I just wonder, and I can't put myself in the position of Russians, but I can't help but wonder if the 27 million people who died during World War II, that is Russians, can't have imprinted itself on the historical consciousness of the Russian people. Yeah. And third, I, I, I feel uncomfortable even raising the subject because I don't have on the ground experience in Eastern Europe, but there is talk by people I respect of the rise of uh, neo-Nazi currents, not only in Ukraine, but in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere. I don't know how powerful a force they are, but what's the extent to which they are part of the threat system from the vantage point of Moscow? The map that I showed of the bases would seem to me to constitute uh, a threat in and of itself. And that coupled with militaristic language and threatening language, it seems to me it's got to have an effect uh, from, from how people in Moscow look at the world. So Are you ready? that's all I would have to add. Very good. Let me just uh, respond to questions, uh, sort of technical questions in the chat. And that is, 
how can people get a hold of your uh, excellent PowerPoint and also the recording of this year forum? If all goes well, we can try and put both of those on our website, which is unamilwaukee.org. Um, but uh, Sam uh, Harry has offered a direct uh, email connection to get it from him. So there's that. Um, Joan uh, Robertson is next with a question. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for both of your, your uh, dissertations. They were wonderful, very inspiring. A hypothetical question would be if President Zelensky uh, had taken the Gandhi approach of nonviolence, peaceful resistance, what if they had let, I can only visualize if they had let the Russians come in, the saving of the destruction, demo, demolition of their cities, the loss of life, the culture, the starvation that has occurred throughout the world because of this. What if they had done that? Put on a courage of peaceful nonviolence and let them come in. It would take years. It took Gandhi what? made 80 years or so to oust the British after the subjugation of India. But what if they had done that? What's your thought? What should pacifists do in such a situation? Uh, Gary or Gary, care to start? Well, I, I guess I, I could uh, start on that. Uh, dealing with Russia, uh, and, and, and the language that uh, Vladimir Putin had th thrown out before the invasion. I, I had the hopes that uh, uh, it would, in a way, it'd be a repeat of the Munich uh, situation uh, in 1938, that uh, uh, Putin was making a threat that if he'd gotten resistance, he would not invade, but he invaded. So that, that theory is gone. Uh, Joan, it's... Um, um, the, the history of Ukraine uh, has, in dealing with uh, Moscow has been very troubling. Uh, during the revolution in 1917, uh, the Ukrainians broke uh, off from uh, Imperial Russia. Uh, all over uh, Russia, Stalin was organizing workers and soldiers councils called Soviets. And uh, one started in Ukraine uh, during the Civil War uh, that uh, called for independence of Ukraine. And uh, it had, was called the Rada, and it, it, was, um, it was crushed by the Red Army. Uh, you know, so, and that, that, that was, of course, a violent time. There, there was just no way. I, I really think if uh, the, the Ukrainians had put together a sit-down strike, a peace, and let the Soviets come in, it would have resulted in a serious repression uh, anyway. Uh, Terry, you don't, don't feel obligated, but if you want to have a chance to respond uh, to the question. Well, um, I, I think there's a, a logic to what Gary said. Um, it, as unpalatable as it, it sounds, I think a surrender would have saved lives and uh, physical infrastructure. But that's a hard pill to swallow. And as Gary suggests, that may not have been uh, uh, led to more positive results. Uh, but we have this period from uh, the coup in Ukraine in 2014, the uh, conversation in Belarus and Minsk, uh, and the establishment of the Minsk Accord. You have lots of time where Zelensky might have said, we would not like to, um, we're not gonna request joining NATO. Uh, NATO spokespersons might have said, uh, we're not, we don't expect Ukraine to draw a join NATO. So there was a lot of diplomatic possibilities, it seems to me, be, between 2014 and today. 
that didn't represent the pacifist approach, but at the same time represented a diplomatic approach that might have led to different results. And of course, we we cannot know, but um, I think I think the uh, conduct of uh, all the parties between 2014 and today has been very unfortunate and unhelpful. Well, that's passed. Well, uh, Did you have a reply, Joan? Yes, she does. See, that's I, I was saying that's all very well, but it's passed. But this is 2022. Uh, things move much faster. The resistance might have had more effect quicker than what Gandhi uh, uh, achieved. So, I mean, don't you think that really there is a way that that could have worked had the President Zelensky been able to convince his people that yes, they would let them come in, the Russians come in, but they would put up the passive resistance. And of course, the rest of the world would support that. Uh, John, extent, I'm that's, sure. that's a, a, a wonderful and gracious ideal, but uh, the entire run of R Russian history has been built on military conquest. And, and uh, Ukraine has had uh, pretty rough treatment at the hands of the Soviet during the 30s. Uh, there were purges and various things. And it, it just isn't in, the, you know, it, I, I, I just can't imagine, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of someplace in our, 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 rec our anti-Vietnam thing where people put flowers in, in the guns of tanks and uh, it, it may work temporarily, but, but when you saw that line of tanks lined up for I know. miles and miles, you know, and, and with a plan basically that echoed the Franco-Prussian war was to invade, knock them out and surround the city and overthrow the government. I, I, I you know, the, the, the nationalistic feelings that Ukrainians had I don't. I, I don't think it could have been rallied in the way you suggest. It would be wonderful if it could, but I just don't think that's possible. Let me. See, uh, Art yeah. has an Art has an important point to add. Right, right. So I was going to. I see Art has his hand up. Let me uh, offer Art uh, three things. Uh, a response to Joan's question, if you had another question or a comment of your own, and then since I'd offered to give a chance for uh, announcements at eleven thirty, I know you have two hopefully very brief ones about Cuba issues. So. Hmm. Art, over to you. Um, sounds like a triple header. Uh, well, my question or comment was, what do either of the speakers think of <clears throat> what I view as a very uh, uh, distorted, one-sided, censored uh, access to the basic facts of the situation? I mean, we all know and hear a lot about the censorship in Russia, but... Uh, you know, what I put in the chat was uh, just one example of what our media doesn't report. You know, the, uh, um, yeah, I have limited time here, but uh, the, uh, you know, friends of mine, peace people, think everything that Putin says about the neo-Nazis, et cetera, is completely uh, manufactured when there's, you know, I don't justify what he did and Everybody sort of picks something out of a hole and makes it a big thing, bigger than it might be. But I urge people to look up on Wikipedia the Azov Battalion, uh, which, among other things, uh, uh, states, I think, quoting the Nation magazine, it's the only country in the world where there's a neo-Nazi element of their military forces, and that's the Ukraine and the so-called Revolution of Dignity post-214. Uh, coup Ukraine. I mean, the fact that the, an elected president was uh, forced out in 2014 with clear U.S. encouragement, um, which then led to the uh, separation in the eastern provinces, and then a, a war that's killed 14,000 people. So, 
maybe 80% of those on the Eastern Front. And you've got this neo-Nazi element, which are very good street fighters. They're not that popular or weren't before this war in the, uh, in the polls, but they're allowed to run while the third largest party was banned, which is the uh, Communist Party of Ukraine, got millions of votes, illegal, people put in, ar arrested for liking Hammer and Sickle on YouTube, etc. This is all in, in what we are told is the, the democracy of the Ukraine post-2014 compared to the Russian uh, autocracy. And uh, so, I, I, my, so my question is, how, what do you think of the ability of US people to find out basic facts that would make this whole situation a little bit more balanced than it is? And uh, including whether there is or isn't a neo-Nazi element of, the of military strength in the East that is intimidated to Zelensky. Um, so that's um, base number one. <laughs> uh, you want me to make the announcements too? Steve? You can do it real quick. Yeah, well, the UN General Assembly at least 29 years in a row has condemned the US um, uh, economic blockade of Cuba. Uh, there are events in Milwaukee trying to highlight and support that vote. Um, on uh, the last Sunday of the month, which is June 26 at 1 p.m., there'll be another bike and car caravan to highlight that. And it will be leaving from and returning to the uh, yeah. uh, ZOA, uh, uh, or ZAO, I guess it's pronounced, uh, MKE Church, which is in the old Kenwood United Methodist Church, right across um, Kenwood Boulevard from the UWM Union. We invite people who have a rally first to highlight that. And at the same place, on July 6th, Wednesday evening, there will be a program with Pastors for Peace you know, with it, raising money to bring essential medicines to Cuba, which are being blockaded even by our current uh, liberal uh, Democratic president. So I invite you to both of those things. Uh, it's 2319 East Kenwood, again, right across the street from the UW Union. Uh, thank you. All right, very good. Speakers, care to comment on censorship uh, sort of issues? I, I'd like to comment on news media in general, uh, which is we have a serious news problem in this country. We have a great many millions of people getting their information from propaganda networks like Fox News and uh, hate radio like Alex Jones and so forth. And it, it's playing out uh, with the hearings on January 6th uh, that uh, millions of people believe the big lie. And you know they, they don't believe what they can see uh, and the video re reports of what happened. And uh, as far as national security is concerned, <laughs> Uh, January 6 is a, a prelude to the biggest threat to democracy that we have, and, and national security for that matter, uh, if we don't get under control and, and clarify the situation of what uh, uh, the Trump administration and, and the follow-up has done to this country. So, and, it, and the communication is just thank, thank heavens we have a couple of newspapers that are good, but you know, look what's happened to the Gannett papers now. And people don't read newspapers, people don't read books. When I was teaching, I would ask my students uh, at Concordia and uh, where do you get your news? How do you get, and, and they, they had no answer. They would get news online, that's it. And it's, that's a, a real problem, Art. Gary? Yes. Um... I, I agree with Gary. The, the topic of the political economy of popular culture and news is a terribly important subject. Media concentration, the data is clear on, on both print media and electronic media. Uh, community newspapers are folding on a rapid pace. To the extent they're not, they're, they're purchased by investors who have no interest in media. Uh, the only thing I would add is that our popular cable uh, newscasts uh, should involve both looking, ser interrogating not just Fox News, but MSNBC, 
and CNN. I just finished a book by Matt Tahibi, who writes critically about the mass media. And he argues what I believe to be the case is that MSNBC and Fox News need each other. And in terms of Art's point, uh, the narratives about uh, US foreign policy um, are very narrow and one-sided in the so-called mainstream uh, media as well as Fox. Very good. This is a great discussion and it's uh, even just really warming up at this point, I'd say, but um, people do have other things to do. Uh, why don't we just take maybe one or two more questions, um, wrap up the formal part, but if the speakers and our audience wants to stay on and talk a little bit more, uh, I think that's possible. So um, another question or comment from the audience, or maybe not. Let me, let me say a few words. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and, and uh, as did Annette in her introduction of Gary, uh, even within our chapter, we found there are different views on what to think and what uh, we would prescribe for the US and or the UN or NATO to do concerning the terrible war in Ukraine. Um, we've not resolved it. I'm hoping people get a little bit clearer on some things or what to ask or what to look for. Uh, we do talk to our Congress people. We have very active in the wars committee within the United Nations chapter. And some people in that are on the Zoom now and some aren't. And we just had, for example, a, a Zoom conference with one of the staffers for Representative Gwen Moore from Milwaukee and talked about Ukraine and sending $40 billion worth of support for that war and whether that was a good idea or not. So while we will not be having any more forums over the summer, starting up again in September, we do have committees and work that go on. So if any of you would care to help us or um, participate in any way with our activities, be sure to let us know. So having said that. If I had, had one thing of communication with Harry. Um, in my last year graduate school in, in Madison, before I went off to teach at River Falls, uh, we had an enormous rally on Bascom Hill solid students from the Abe Lincoln statue on down to Spark mm -hmm. Avenue. And one of the speakers was William Appleman Williams, who was teaching in Madison at that time. And uh, it was, a, you know, he, he was a star of the anti-war movement nationwide. And it was, it was kind of a thrill to see him. And, and then um, following him, uh, out came uh, the president of the university system, which was smaller then, just four campuses and the two-year campuses, Fred Harvey Harrington. Mm -hmm. uh, he interrupted his seminar to come down and speak. And the topic of that rally was students uh, protesting against the fact that poor people, minorities and so forth were being drafted while they had their student deferments keeping them out of the war. So it was an altruistic event mm -hmm. by this mass of students and with, with the faculty member and the president of the university coming out supporting it was quite a moving thing. Now, going back to art, I guess what we need is that kind of mobilization uh, against injustice and everything. And I'm afraid that uh, the first thing we have to do is solve the problem with the big lie and, and then go on from there. But we could start closing down Guantanamo. That would, that would be a cheap thing and a way to get going. Hey, Steve? Yes. Uh, I would just want to add that uh, our, our discussion has been profoundly pessimistic, as it should be. But I think I'm also encouraged by the, uh, the rise of grassroots movements, often led by young people, uh, movements of people who are angry about the impending uh, overturn of Roe v. Wade. Uh, there's the mobilization is at next weekend of the New Poor People's Campaign in, in Washington. And there'll be, there'll be a Code Pink dele delegation, which will encourage the New Poor People's Campaign to incorporate military spending and international issues in, in their work. So there's just a lot of stuff going on. And coming here in the summer, from uh, North Central Indiana to Milwaukee. I'm kind of encouraged to see all the work that you guys are doing. And 
So there's that side as well. There's growing resistance and mobilization and people seeking out, seeking out alternative forms of, of education. And as Vijay Prashad points out, growing resistance in the global South as well. Very good. So we should, we uh, Jerry, forget. to stand up, uh, we'll give him the last uh, comment from the audience, uh, give the speakers a chance to say a last word, um, see if there are any more announcements, and then call it a day, unless you want to stay on uh, after that, but we'll end the formal part of the uh, program. So, if, Jerry, over to you. Oh, Steve, my uh, Joan would like to just say one thing before Gary speaks. Yeah, uh, I, back to the media, I find C-SPAN uh, one and two, I can't get the rest. I find it very valuable for information uh, from leading authors, especially with Weekend Book TV. I encourage people to look at C-SPAN and watch what goes on in Congress. Thank you. Very good. Some people like uh, the show Democracy Now! as well. Jerry? You talk me again? Okay. Sorry, we're still... A concluding remark. No, wait, Gary, Gary, I, I, the, the other I hope... Gary, hold on. That Steve was calling upon me. Oh, okay. Well, yo, please. I Steve, thank you, Jerry, for making Steve, this. We've been, we've been blessed with a lot of people who've tuned in today who have not participated in our meetings previously. So perhaps you could give some information about how they could connect up with us and uh, consider becoming a member of the UNA of Greater Milwaukee. Thank you. Very good. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our website is unamilwaukee.org, and uh, there's a way on there to join and or to contact us. And so, uh, so please do for whatever question or comment, or if you'd like to see more about our activities. So was there a question too, Jerry, or just that? I guess that. All right, so final comments, uh, start with Gary. Uh, I see Luba's on, so dobre den, Luba. Horosho. At any rate, uh, I hope that this program at least uh, gives uh, my friends and colleagues in the peace movement a little better perspective about NATO. Uh, I think uh, it's you know it's based on fact. NATO does a lot more good than harm. No one's perfect. Occasionally there are screw ups, uh, but uh, uh, it, it's a peacemaker more than it is a warrior. Okay. And for a different point of view, Harry. Uh, I'm more pessimistic about uh, NATO, but you know, one quick way to end is who was it that said, don't mourn, organize, and we've got our tasks set out for us. And thanks for inviting me. Thank you both for uh, making presentations and asking, answering some pretty hard questions. Um, do people want to make announcements of other things we need to know coming up? Um, th there is a stand for peace today, by the way, uh, at noon, if somebody wants to plug that. I guess not. All right, um, so this uh, ends our formal part of the presentation. Once again, thanks to the great speakers and for all of you to tune in. Excuse me, Steve. I, I sure. thought that stand um, was only going to take place for 15 minutes in case people showed up at 35th and Fond du Lac. People are being encouraged to go to the march um, at noon downtown. Can you say what the details on the march then? Uh, <laughs> I have to look up the details. <laughs> All I know is downtown at noon. <laughs> Against gun violence at noon at uh, 9th and Wells. Yeah, it's at the, it's, a, it's at the courthouse, and they're marching to the um, Deer District, uh, the March for Our Lives. Uh, so it's to protest the gun violence situation. So there you go, from the courthouse to the Deer District, starting at noon. Other things we need to know coming up on the front of peace and justice. All right, oh, very good. So if the speakers are willing to stay on, if any of the audience wants to stay on, Martha, can you keep the Zoom going for a little longer?